So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to this um, April Matrix Online Seminar. Uh, we're very uh, pleased to have Cheryl Prager as our speaker today. Um, Cheryl has had a very long and illustrious career. I'll, I'll just summarize that uh, by saying that she obtained a PhD in 1974 from the University of Oxford, and this year was awarded for uh, two lifetime achievements. One was the order uh, of the, sorry, the companion of the Order of Australia for eminent service to mathematics, to tertiary education as a leading academic and researcher and to international organizations and as a champion of women in STEM careers. Um, and she also won the inaugural Ruby Payne Scott Medal of the Australian Academy of Science, which is one of the most prestigious awards of the uh, Academy. Um, Cheryl has been one of the trailblazers, I guess, of the female cause in Australian mathematics and doing an outstanding uh, job at that. And today we look forward to hearing about her research, uh, title of her talk, Co-Prime Actions on Finite Groups. Cheryl, over to you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan, and, and um, welcome everyone to the Matrix Seminar. Um, I'm actually giving this talk close to the campus of the University of Western Australia in Perth, and um, the traditional owners of these lands are the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, today's talk is called Co-Prime Actions of Finite Groups, and I'm hoping that it will be helpful and interesting to a fairly wide audience. I'm going to tell you about a, a problem, a question that I was working on with a group of um, colleagues. And it's about finite groups acting on vector spaces. That's at least where it starts. But it ended up and took us on a trip through to questions dating back to 1935 about primitive permutation groups. So let's start at the beginning. We imagine that we've got a finite group H and it's acting as non-singular linear transformations of a, a vector space V, finite dimensional. Um, traditionally, when we start learning about this at university, um, we would take the space to be uh, over the complex numbers and we would learn uh, that the vector space can be decomposed as a sum of possibly more than one um, smaller subspaces, each of them invariant, left invariant by this group. And they're special because the H is going to be irreducible on each of these subspaces, meaning that the only H invariant subspace of, of the I will be the zero space and the I itself. Now this, this property is called complete reducibility. So we say that the group H is completely reducible on V. And that's true always when the fields are complex numbers, but it, it, it remains true in a lot of cases. So if, if the field is finite even, so finite of order a power of some prime P, then it's still true provided that H is, the order of H is not divisible by P. So if in a lot of cases, um, a group H would still be acting completely reducibly on V but it might not always be the case. So let me show you an example where the group is not completely reducible. And this is a concept that I'm gonna need later on. So that's why I'm taking us through it rather carefully. So I could take a two dimensional space, just say over the field of integers modulo or prime P. And if I take the group H to be all of the non-singular matrices with a zero in the top right corner, they form a group. And um, the only subspaces of V which are invariant under H are the whole space, the zero space, and one one-dimensional space generated by the, or spanned by the first standard basis vector one zero. So there's no companion second one space to give us a decomposition. So this group is not completely reducible. <clears throat> 
Okay, so that's one concept I want you to think about. Um, the title of the talk is about co-prime actions or co-prime orbits of a group. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So again, we've got a finite group acting on a vector space. You don't really need F to be finite, um, but I'll be talking about that later. So take any vector A, by the H orbit containing A, we mean the collection of images of the vector A under all of the elements of H. So that gives us a set of vectors, the H orbit. And if I think of the H orbits containing two different vectors, A and B, then um, those orbits are going to be called co-prime if, well, first off, I want the sizes of the orbits to be at bigger than one. So the vectors are not going to be fixed by everything in H. So they're both bigger than one and the lengths are co-prime. There's no prime in common between the two orbits. So they're co-prime orbits. Let me give you a small example to see um, uh, what could happen. This is the tiniest one I could think of. If I took the field of order two, so just zero and one, the binary field, and I take a two-dimensional space over it, a direct sum, um, a three-dimensional space. And I'll take H to be the biggest uh, subgroup of transformations that fixes this decomposition. So we could think of it as the direct product of the general linear group of the small space of two dimensions times the general linear group on a three-dimensional space. Or to think about it concretely, we could take H to be the set of um, block diagonal matrices where the first block A uh, is acting on a two-dimensional space and the second block B is again invertible and acting on a three-dimensional space. So to take some vectors, let me choose uh, any non-zero vector in the first two space, call it A naught and a vector B naught non-zero in the three space. And then I would have um, my first vector A being A naught on the two space and zero on the three space, so that vector, and B to be the similar one, zero on the two space and B naught on the three space. So what happens when I apply all of the elements of H to these vectors? Well, in the first case, I would get all of, essentially all of the non-zero vectors in the two space. All of the non-zero vectors can go here, and there's only three of them in a two-dimensional space over the field of order two. And similarly for H, I will get all of the non-zero vectors in this three space and there's seven of them. So I've got two co-prime orbits. And in this case, all of the other non-zero vectors, and there's exactly 21 of them left, they form a single, a single extra orbit. So there's the tiniest example of co-prime orbits. So where did the question come from? I had a visit, a, a sabbatical visit by um, an Italian mathematician, Silvio Dolfi from Firenze. And uh, at the same time, um, Pablo Spiga, who's now in Milano, he was uh, working at UWA as a, a postdoc. And later on in this project, um, we enlisted the help of Bob Gorolnik from uh, USC. Um, so, We'll tell you about how Bob um, arrived on the scene later, but at the beginning it was Silvio and Pablo and me. Silvio said that his colleague Gabriel Navarro had asked the following question. He said, suppose that you've got a finite group H and it's completely reducible, so we know what that means, completely reducible on a vector space V. And suppose that H has got co-prime orbits of lengths M and N, so M and N are co-prime. Um, Gabriel says, must H also have an orbit of length M times N? Well, I've just shown you a tiny example that says this could sometimes happen, where we had an orbit of length three and one of length seven, and all the rest of the vectors gave us an orbit of length three times seven, 21. So it's not a, an unusual thing to happen, but must it always happen? And also this funny um, condition of being completely reducible, what's that doing? 
So we know that actions are always completely reducible over complex numbers, but they certainly aren't um, always if the field or the vector space is finite. Let me show you that something weird can happen and we really can't drop this, this condition. So I'll go back to my two dimensional space over um, a field of prime order, but the prime, the size of the, the field doesn't really matter. And this time I'm going to take a slightly smaller subgroup of translations. So I still want to have zero in the top right corner. I'm going to have a one in the bottom right corner. Um, and the X and the Y can be anything they like, but of course it's got to be non-singular, so X is non-zero. So in fact, there's P minus one choices for X and there's P choices for Y. So that's how big the group is. Right, even though it's a slightly smaller group, still the only H invariant subspaces are V, the zero space, and this single one space. So this group is not completely reducible. And then if we work out what are the orbits of H on the P squared vectors, we will get one of length one, that's the zero vector. We will get an orbit of length P minus one, that's all of the non-zero vectors in this fixed one space. And the rest of the orbits get split up into P minus one orbits of length P. So this group does have co-prime orbit lengths P and P minus one. And it certainly does not have any orbit of length p times p minus one. So we, we can't drop the completely reducible thing. So that's why I had to tell you about it because it's one of the conditions. And we've seen that there are examples. Let me show you another big, big family of examples, how it would be easy to construct some natural examples. A little bit like the tiniest example I showed you before. So supposing we take um, any group K that um, acts on some vector space U and that happens to have an orbit of length N. And we'll do the same, any group L acting on a vector space W that happens to have an orbit of length N where the M and the N are co-prime. This is actually quite easy to find. Now I'll take the vector space to be the direct sum of U and W. I guess I'm thinking that they're over the same field, okay? So I'll take the direct sum of those two vector spaces. And for the group, I'm going to take the direct product of K and L, thinking of them as block matrices with K acting on U and L acting on W. And then inside of V, I pick the orbit corresponding to the um, vector A naught of U. So I'm going to take A naught on U and the zero acting on W. So A naught plus zero, that vector, apply everything in H, it's only the K that's acting really, and I get an orbit of length N. For the second orbit, I will do the similar thing for W. I'll take zero plus B naught. That vector, that's my vector B, I apply H and it's only the elements of L which are really moving it around and I will get an orbit of length N. So there I've got my two co-prime orbits and then when I take the vector A plus B, that's the pair A naught comma B naught, apply all the elements in H, the images that I get would be the pairs where U is any K image of A naught and W is any L image of B naught, and these are completely independent, and so I'll get M times N images, an orbit of length M times N. So this is a fairly flexible way of finding a lot of examples of groups with co-prime orbits, M and N, and another orbit, which we get this way by adding up A and B. And so our question when we thought of these examples was, do the examples of co-prime orbits arise more or less like this? Okay, let me first just jump and tell you what we were able to do, and then I'll say some more about it. We managed to say yes. Gabrielle's question, we, we said yes, 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 this is exactly what is happening always. But in so doing, we discovered something which really surprised us 
and I'll tell you about it later, it happened about the irreducible actions of finite groups. We were not expecting it. And then the, the thing I want to say is that in proving, improving these results, we needed to use the simple group classification. It's really quite a deep result. I have no idea that there's any other uh, proof possible, but the, the question there is, is out there. Uh, so we have a very deep theorem, a very deep proof anyway. We use class, simple group classification and representation theory. And then thinking about what we had discovered with this surprising result, it led us to think a bit back further about old questions about permutation groups. So here are the theorems to do with Gabriel Navarro's question. So what we proved is that if you take a finite group acting completely reducibly on the vector space B, and you have the orbit containing A of length M and the orbit containing vector B of length N and M and N are co-prime, then we prove that a plus b lies in an h orbit of length m times n. So it sort of looks like what we expected from the natural construction that I gave you. Alongside and partnered with this theorem is what we call the irreducible theorem. And this is what really surprised us. Suppose I have a finite group acting irreducibly on a finite vector space. Then we prove that h cannot, cannot have co-prime orbits. And this was really unexpected for us. And in fact, it's a critical component of our proof of Gabriel Navarro's conjecture. And it's this irreducible theorem where we needed to have a very careful use of the simple group classification. Okay, let's start with some comments. How would we use the irreducible theorem to, oh, oh, sorry, how would we prove this irreducible theorem and what's it got to do with simple groups? So let me try to talk us through that for a minute. If we supposed that the irreducible theorem is true, so we if we suppose that if H is a, suppose it's true for, for H being a simple group, that is, suppose that whenever H is a simple group, um, it cannot have co-prime orbits. Now that's something we still have to prove, but this is going to be the heart of the proof. Why is it enough only to think about this? So let's try, make this as an assumption and try to prove theorem two in general. So to start to prove theorem two, we start off with a irreducible group H and we assume it's got co-prime orbits containing A and B, where trying to get a contradiction. So we'll assume that we've got one of these irreducible groups with H with co-prime orbits with the smallest possible order. And by our assumption up here about the theorem being true for simple groups, it means that H is not simple. So we can take a non-trivial proper normal subgroup. And then we start doing a little bit of representation theory. So it's irreducible, it's got co-prime orbits, but it's not simple. Then there's some representation theory that says you can split V up into some smaller H in, or N invariant subspaces for our normal subgroup N. They're not quite irreducible, they're what's called homogeneous. And we mess around with our vectors A and B, and we find that in at least one of these components, we can assume that the, um, the component, say, we might as well assume it's the first one, that the A1 and the B1 are non-zero. And then we have a little bit more argument that replaces the orbit of H containing A with the orbit of N containing the A1. And similarly with the B1, we prove that they are co-prime because we prove that this orbit length can divides M and the second one divides N. So we get a smaller group, smaller orbits, unfortunately not irreducible yet, but we work a little bit harder and we find um, an irreducible subgroup and we reduce some, to some yet smaller orbits. We find that they're co-prime and then by minimality, 
since we've now found a smaller group N with co-prime orbits and acting irreducibly, we get our contradiction. So that kind of reduction is fine, but it says really you have to look at irreducible actions of simple groups. How would you prove that? So now we've got to have a non-abelian simple group to have co-prime orbits of sizes M and N. The first thing we said to ourselves, well, by basic group theory, if we've got two orbits and they've got, um, oops, if they've got co-prime lengths, then it tells us that our group H can be factorized as the stabilizer of vector A times the stabilizer of vector B. And we were thinking, well, we know about factorizing simple groups. Um, and this is a fairly, it's got some things special about it. Um, the indices of the two subgroups are co-prime. So our first um, attempt was to do a very big um, analysis of co-prime orbits of uh, co-prime factorizations of non-abelian simple groups and get a whole long list and start trying to look at them. Well, we couldn't get the list of all of them. We could get the list of those where the stabilizers were maximal, but it was really horrible. And so that was at the point when we asked Bob Gorelnik for some help thinking, surely we can do something better than using hard simple group theory to prove this result, which seems like it shouldn't be so hard. So eventually working with Bob going backwards and forwards quite a bit, we proved this little lemma, which is kind of interesting. So we, we forget about the fact that um, H is simple and we take an irreducible action and we suppose we can write this group as a product of two smaller subgroups, A and B. Um, and the index of A, so the number of A cosets and the number of B cosets are co-prime. And working with Bob, we put in this purple condition, um, which looks like it's got nothing to do with anything to do with our problem. Let me tell you the condition. So every element in H should be conjugate to its inverse under some automorphism of H. So a funny purple condition. With that condition, we could prove that the we couldn't have both A and B being stabilizers of vectors. So we could not have the sort of factorization we would have if we were trying to prove our irreducible theorem. So how good or how general is this purple condition? Well, it turns out that if we look at all the simple groups, um, they come in various varieties. Some of them are alternating groups, some of them are classical groups, and for all of those groups, the purple condition holds. So we couldn't have an alternating group or a classical group as our simple group for our irreducible theorem. What's left are the sporadic groups and the exceptional D-type groups. Now, for the exceptional D-type groups, it turns out that all of the maximal factorizations were classified by Herring, Liebeck and Saxel. So we looked at them all and none of them were co-prime. So that was really lucky, they're all gone. That leaves the sporadic simple groups, there's just 26 of them. All of the factorizations of the sporadic simple groups were classified by Michael Judici. Well, there were some co-prime ones, but only for three of the groups. So this lemma got us down to just looking at three sporadic simple groups, three of the Matteo groups. Irritating, but uh, we could look at all of those actions and make sure that none of them were going to give us co-prime actions of a, one of these groups on a vector space acting irreducibly. So we proved that using this rather irritating method that all the irreducible linear groups um, can have no co-prime orbits on vectors fine. So where does that get us when we're trying to prove Navarro's conjecture? How does it work? So I suppose, let me just say a few words about that because I really want to get on and tell you where it was leading us as well. So we start off with a, a finite group, completely reducible on a vector space, and it's got 
two co-prime orbits containing A and B, lengths M and N. So we, we did some uh, reductions this way by trying to cut away at the vector space. So we firstly reduced to the case where the vector space could be written as the smallest sub H invariant subspace containing A plus the smallest H invariant subspace containing B. That was the first reduction. And then there's a good case and a bad case. In the good case, where these two spaces intersect trivially, so that means that our vector space is in direct sum, it's starting to look like the examples that I showed you at the beginning. And here we were able to show that the um, H orbit containing the sum A plus B definitely had length M times N, exactly what we wanted, even though H might not be like the example group that I showed you. So that was the great case. How about the bad case? The bad case is where these two subspaces um, intersect non-trivially. It took quite an effort, but we managed to find inside um, a small H invariant submodule contained inside this intersection and a replacement vectors A and B inside of S, such that we had some co-prime orbits for H inside of this irreducible H action. And then we could go to our irreducible theorem and say, nope, that is not possible. So that was the way we, we proved our theorem. Nice. So why were we so curious about this um, irreducible theorem? Well, the way, the way, so let me remind you, it says that if you have a group H acting irreducibly on a finite vector space, you cannot have co-prime orbits on vectors. So what we thought was, well, if we just throw in the translations as well as these irreducible group of linear transformations, we'll get ourselves a fa fairly standardly an affine group. So we have um, group G, it's an extension of um, the translation group with our irreducible linear group H. This is a primitive permutation group of affine type acting on the vector space V. And what we had just proved was that the stabilizer, so H is the stabilizer of the zero vector in this action, the stabilizer um, cannot have orbits of co-prime lengths. Now, the orbits of a point stabilizer in a permutation group are called the suborbits, and their lengths are called the subdegrees. So the irreducible theorem we had just proved is exactly saying that finite affine primitive groups cannot have co-prime subdegrees. That is, lengths of stabilizer orbits cannot be co-prime. Now, this was a very old question that many people had looked at. Let me tell you about it. So you might ask, well, there's a lot of other sorts of primitive permutation groups. Can they have co-prime subdegrees? And the answer is yes. Um, here is a very famous example. The, the Yanko sporadic simple group, the smallest Yanko group, acts on 266 points, and its stabilizer has five orbits of length. One, the fixed point, one of length 11, one of length 12, one of length 110, that's 11 times 10, one of length 132. So we've got co-prime orbits, co-prime subdegrees, 11 and 12. And by the way, we've got one of length 132. So it can happen for some almost simple groups, and we just proved it can't happen for the affine groups. And then we remembered that way back in 1935, Murray Wise was looking at um, general finite primitive permutation groups. Um, if we just say not cyclic of prime order, then um, the, the subdegrees, that's the orbits of the point stabilizer, will be one for the fixed point, and all the other subdegrees will be bigger than one. And she arranged them in non decreasing order. And she proved that the biggest one, the biggest one, N sub R, had to have 
some something in common in its length with with all of the other ones from two up to r minus one so that you couldn't have things which were co-prime where one of them was the biggest suborbit a funny sort of um, fact everyone that had studied permutation groups knew about this but nothing really much had been done about it since 1935 but my um, former PhD supervisor Peter Neumann had uh, been giving some lectures and published a, a beautiful book of, of lecture notes in 1973 where part of what he was doing was to reinterpret Murray Weiss's proof uh, to say something a little bit more. So he's saying that if G is a finite primitive group, and here are its sub degrees, N1, N2, up to NR, and Peter said in his lecture notes, suppose that K of these numbers, N sub I, are pairwise co-prime then the rank, that is the number of the orbits, has to be at least two to the k. Now, if we have a look at the Yanko group, it's got rank five, the point stabilizer, five orbits. And we had 11 and 12, which were co-prime, so k is two. And Murray Wise's proof, as reinterpreted by Peter Neumann, was saying, well, the rank has to be at least four, but here we had an example where the rank was five. And so Peter Neumann was asking um, whether there were any rank four examples with co-prime subdegrees. And this was quite a, um, an interesting question to ask. And Peter Cameron answered it and said, no, 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 you cannot have, he proved that you cannot have one with rank four with two co-prime subdegrees. That was not possible. So the Yanko example was the minimum rank R. So we started to ask, well, hmm, first of all, given our irreducible theorem, what kinds of primitive groups can have co-prime subdegrees? We knew affine no, almost simple yes, because of the Yanko example, what about the others? Second question, how big can this um, K parameter of Peter Neumann be? We know it can be two, can it be any bigger? Okay, let me tell you that we've got some answers to that. So what are the types of primitive groups that could possibly or not possibly have co-prime subdegrees? So there's affine types, we'd answered no. There's almost simple, we know that the answer is yes. So there's another type which are called diagonal type. We um, worked quite hard and we showed no, they cannot have co-prime subdegrees either. Product type, um, which are built up from the almost simple examples. Yes, we built examples starting off with almost simple examples, so the answer there was yes. And there's one last type, which was twisted wreath, which was very hard to work around. I'll just show you one disgusting example in a minute, but we managed to construct one. And uh, we, we published our paper just a few years ago, and we asked, hmm, are there any more? Because the one we had constructed was, well, let me show you. This is what we constructed. We constructed this group. Um, it was built out of the second smallest finite simple group, a group of order 168. And the number of points it was acting on was 168 to the power 168. And we proved that the group that we built, the twisted reef group that we built, had um, stabilizer H, um, which is pretty tiny, um, and it had two orbits at least. <laughs> but anyway, we found an orbit of length 49 and an orbit of length 576. And it was so dreadful um, that we asked, well, could it, could there be many more? And we didn't want to look for any more. But uh, some colleagues of ours uh, found infinite families of twisted wreath groups with co-prime subdegrees. So they did exist. Um, and this paper was wonderfully um, produced by um, an extremely talented honours student, Alexander Chua, with his supervisors, Michael Judici and Luke Morgan at the University of Western Australia. Okay, so what about the other question? How big 
can K be? This was pretty daunting. At first we discussed, well, maybe we should prove that K can't be too big. Maybe it can't be bigger than 10 or 20. And then Pablo put his foot down and said, no, he'd done some experiments and he believed that K could not be any bigger than two. And in fact, he persuaded us to try really hard to prove this. And that's what we did. So our last theorem was to say, to prove that it is not possible to have K bigger than two. It is not possible for a finite primitive permutation group to have even three pairwise co-prime subdegrees. And again, this proof reduces down to proving a slightly stronger result about the actions of finite simple groups. So again, this result depends on the finite simple group classification. So I am towards the end of my lecture. Let me just remind you about what I'm hoping that I've conveyed to you. Um, a surprising fact to us that if we take irreducible groups of matrices or linear groups, they, on a finite space, they cannot have co-prime orbits. That if we take a primitive permutation group and look at its stabilizer, it cannot have three pairwise co-prime orbits. As many as three. Can have two, but can have three. And lastly, if we take a completely reducible linear group on a finite space, if it has co-prime orbits of lengths m and n, then the sum of the two vectors generating these two orbits will give us an orbit of length m times n. And maybe there's lots of questions for permutation groups which could also be asked, but there I think I would like to stop and thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Joe, and I'll applaud a while. <laughs> uh, there's a question in the Q&A uh, function. Uh, do you have an example of G, of an element in G of exceptional type, such that the element is not conjugate to its inverse under the automatism group? Ah, so I'm thinking, hmm, that that must be true and I suppose we didn't write it down in our paper, so I cannot tell you offhand. Um, maybe it's just that there, there is no nice reference for such a thing. So uh, I apologize, I don't know exactly the answer there. Uh, we, we found for our, um, our, our project that it was easier to go to the classification of maximal factorizations and see that there were no co-prime ones than to answer that question. I, but I really should get back to whoever asked that question. Um, Jan, I must say, I, with my screen on full screen like this, I can't in fact see the, the questions. Oh, I can. Yeah, I can. you can. Yeah. If you, I can. Yeah. Oh, Peter McNamara. Hey, I'll, I'll try and get back to you on that to see whether I'm <laughs> what the answer is. Thank you for the question. Right. Here's another question. Um, in the examples of primitive permutation groups with co-prime subdegrees m and n, where you also have a subdegree n times n, is the stabilizer for the m n orbit always the intersection of the stabilizers for the m orbit and the n orbit? Oh, what a nice question. Um, yes. Uh, hmm. Hmm. The, the answer is yes, if the orbit we're looking at is uh, the orbit generated by A plus B, where A gives us the orbit of length M and B gives us the orbit of length N. Um, and that's just by looking at indices of, um, of subgroups. Uh, but when you, when you say, uh, if you just take an arbitrary orbit of size n n then I don't know if it's not if, if if there happened to be some random reason for having a completely different orbit of length m times n I guess the answer would be no I could construct for you an example um, where that wasn't the case just by say adding on an extra vector space and an extra bit of the group acting completely independently of the, the two orbits of length m and n 
Um, so it's a bit of a, a, a roundabout answer, isn't it? Let me read it to see whether I've exactly got your question right. Yes, yeah. So, so the answer is if, if, you, if you construct that orbit um, from the two orbits which are given to you, the answer will be yes. If the, if the um, vectors in the orbit are A plus B, but no in general. So I'm, I'm not a group theorist, but is, is there any um, sense in, in uh, lifting this to infinite groups or do you need finiteness always to make sense of these ideas? The, the whole question certainly makes sense um, for arbitrary actions. If I just have a fine, well, I need a finite group to make some sort of sense of finite um, numbers of images. But I don't know how we would have the, the techniques available um, to, to answer the question. Although people with much more uh, representation theoretic expertise than me might be able to make sense of it and see that what we are using was merely representation theory rather than the finiteness of the space. Because yep. as long as the group's finite, all the orbits are going to be finite. Okay, uh, I don't see any further questions. So uh, Cheryl, thanks again for, for such a lovely talk and surprising, uh, simple, but surprising results uh, in, in your work. And finally, the time uh, to present a Matrix Online seminar. It's a pleasure. Thanks everyone for attending and we uh, hope to see you again next month uh, at, at our next uh, Matrix seminar. Okay, bye everyone.